Well, good morning. Uh, and I want to say good morning to those of you watching online as well this morning. Um, it is wonderful to be with you all this morning and to have the opportunity to worship um, with you all this morning. I, I did want to start out this morning um, just by being a little bit honest and, and a little bit, I guess, vulnerable, saying, you know, I know like many of you, my heart is heavy this morning um, as I've been seeing what's going on in our country, what's, what's happening in the news, reading about it, seeing it even as close to home as um, Lincoln, you know, the, the division in our nation, the destruction, the anger, the hatred, the, the prejudice, um, the lack of respect for authority, you know, it just hurts my heart. Um, and as I have been grappling uh, w with the fact that there is still racism, um, it's still active in, in some and many settings. And so I, I know um, that all of these actions come from um, direction, they're a direct result of sin and human depravity, right? That, that's, as Christians, we know that's what it boils down to on both sides. Um, we all hopefully agree um, that what happened, the horrific thing that happened to that man in Minneapolis was so devastating, um, so sad. We agree that violent and destructive protests are also horribly long. Um, we agree that the vast majority of police are doing amazing works of service, laying down their, their own well-being on a daily basis for the sake of others. Um, and we also know that media reports are often driven by an agenda, and so we, we don't necessarily have the complete story every time. But we also must wrestle with the question of what can we do about this sin and anger and hatred? What role do we play what impact can we have? Um, you know, I'm reminded of a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And we know that the love that he was talking about was the self-sacrificing, unconditional, eternal love of our Heavenly Father. And as our world seems to get darker, Christ's light shines brighter. That is our hope. As the world gets darker, Christ's light shines brighter. And we are instructed to be bearers of that light, which is ultimately the gospel, right? Um, so, so that is part of our role. And then also, we must continue to be in prayer, um, that I'm reminded so often. And so um, I would like to have um, Terry and, and Kurt and Dave and Deb um, come if they would. This is, uh, they are some of our diaconate. Go ahead and come. And as they come, um, I just want to read a verse that, um, as me and my wife were talking about this, uh, she actually pointed this verse out to me. It's in Second Chronicles chapter 7. Um, and Solomon had rebuilt the temple, um, and that this verse is directed to Israel, but it applies to us as well today. And this is what Second, or Second Chronicles seven fourteen says. It says, "If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land." If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. And so we're just going to start this morning. I didn't know how to start the service, so I just wanted to start in prayer. Um, and so I asked our, some of our diaconate here to come and pray, and I didn't catch Deb before, so there you go, Deb. Um, and so, Terry, if you would open us, and those of you watching online, please join us in prayer right now. You're a part of this, too. And so um, we want to, as a church family, united um, on one front, we want to gather and, and, and pray this morning. So, Terry, if you'd open and, and I'll close. Oh, good morning, Jesus. Um, you are still on the throne, and you are still in control. Mm -hmm. But as that uh, verse said, Lord... Uh, we as a nation need to come together and um, confess our sins mm -hmm. and um, acknowledge that we 
we are not walking um, following you as a nation, Lord, and um, forgive us, Lord. And I, um, I pray that you will just pour out your spirit to convict, to, get, to convict the uh, sin and injustice and hatred mm -hmm. in this world, Lord, that um, we as a nation will fall on our knees and um, ask for forgiveness. For these sins, Lord, and um, just move your spirit in a mighty way, Lord, that, um, that your name will be praised, mm -hmm. and um, thousands and millions will come to Christ, and it's a battle for souls, Lord, but um, pour out your spirit on this land and uh, help us to confess so that you may heal this nation, mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. Father, we look at what's happening today, not only in our country, but in the world, and viruses and, and disease and sickness and so many hurting people. Lord, we just lift them up to you. We pray that you would help them to be drawn to you, Lord. Help them to realize that above the physical healing, they need spiritual healing. Mm -hmm. Lord, we have many, even in our family here, who have health issues, mm -hmm. who need your healing touch. Lord, uh, we think of Lois Bloomquist and, and Don Hall and Jean Holcomb, Carolyn Hall, Bob Wakeley, Nathan, Nathan Roselius, and, and others, Lord. Mm -hmm. We're so thankful that we have a God who is able to heal. Lord, we just lift them up to you and, and uh, pray that you would give them healing, give them peace, help them to sense your presence. Yes, God. In Christ's name. Father, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you, Lord, that your glory is falling on us and shining on us and through us. Mm -hmm. And above all, Lord, that we need to be unified as a church. You've given us an awesome opportunity, Lord, to be your light and your love in this time. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Mm -hmm. We thank you for those who have dedicated their lives to being the first responders and the military and the police in this country. And Lord, we, we know their hearts. Their hearts are to serve. They have a servant heart that you've given each one of us. Father, we pray for your protection over every one of them right now. Mm -hmm. Let there be no division and no, no um, hatred against them. Let them be covered, Lord, in the shadow of your almighty wing. Mm -hmm. Oh, Father God, we thank you for their hearts. We pray for them. We pray for their, their families that you would grant them protection and guard over them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we just want to lift up those that uh, have answered your call to uh, be health care workers. Mm -hmm. Lord, as we're confronted with this uh, virus, it's nude to man and uh, think of all the extra protocols all the learning all the training Father for those areas that have been hit hard and bombarded for the physical exhaustion okay. the compassionate hearts Lord we want to care and help heal and, and many have had to stand beside those who uh suffered and, and died in agony and, and uh, we just pray for the health care workers that you'd heal their hearts uh, that have witnessed that for, for those that are in areas where they haven't had the instance but yet they're fatigued from the extra steps and uh, just the learning curve uh, just pray for them Lord that you'd give them energy that you'd fortify them to continue on 
Lord, uh, we thank you for their dedication. We thank you for their caring compassion. And we pray you bless them for that, Lord. And for those that uh, are affected because uh, the economy, the uh, hospitals, elective procedures are down, so those health care workers that are, are struggling because uh, of that phase, Lord, we just uh, pray that they find their peace in you mm-hmm. and, and uh, continue forward. Mm-hmm. Dear God, I just uh, echo and agree with these prayers that have been prayed, God. God, I do pray that you would forgive us for when we have not seen or valued all human life as equal and precious in your sight. God, I I pray that you would forgive us for when we have had thoughts of hatred or disgust towards others in ways that is sinful, dear God. Um, God, I, I just pray that you would I, I'm not even going to pray that you would remove this, this discomfort from us, God, because I know in it we have an opportunity to experience you in a greater way. But God, I pray that you would help us to be strong, to be firm in the faith, to be proclaiming the hope, the love that is found in you and you alone, God, because ultimately that is the only hope. That is the only thing that can change the human heart, God, is your unconditional love and the understanding of what your son, Jesus Christ, did for us and our need, our depravity, our sin, our need for a Savior, God. And so I pray that through this time, this difficult time, this situation, that that would be proclaimed more boldly and louder Um, and and more throughout our land than ever before. God, I do pray for churches that are ministering in um, the major cities, in in the areas of so much unrest. God, I pray that you would give those churches strength and courage, that we would all support them, and that you would use this to impact people's eternal destiny um, to to save people, to help people recognize their need for you, God. God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have this morning to gather and to worship you, our rock, our never-changing, firm foundation, God. We are excited to do that now. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, um, Diaconate, for that. And I am so excited. I these past few days, I've just been looking forward to this morning, to the opportunity to worship our risen Savior. And so um, we don't need to be somber this morning. Um, We are excited to worship our risen Savior. I do want to highlight a few things from um, the bulletin. Hopefully you picked one up as you came in. Uh, Hey, first of all, this Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m., um, we are having our Awana Awards night. We are so excited to... um, encourage and celebrate and honor the students in our Awana program who have worked hard this year, and we would love to have you join us. The plan is to be outside, um, pray for great weather, um, and we'll have games, ice cream uh, to follow the Awana Awards. So bring a lawn chair um, and join us as we um, celebrate and um, encourage these young people and what they have been doing throughout the year. Uh, Hopefully you got a copy of the newsletter, um, either via email or it was mailed out this week. A lot of good information in there, so hopefully you got a copy of that. If not, we do have some extra copies here, or you might check your church mailbox as well. Um, Next Sunday, uh, the next two Sundays, we have special things coming up. Next Sunday, uh, we will be baptizing Riker Wakely, um, and so I hope that you will join us for that. That will be an exciting um, celebration of of new life. And then the Sunday after that, June 14th, is Confirmation Sunday. And so we hope you'll mark that on your calendar and be here um, as we celebrate two confirmands um, and the hard work they have put in and um, just confirm them in their faith. So please join us for that. Um, You will see the insert on the bulletin has uh, information from our two camps 
um, with summer camp being canceled, um, just information that you'll want to know. Covenant Cedars is doing a cool, exciting um, camp in a box or camp from home box. So uh, that's pretty cool. That's creative. I'm thankful to them for, for offering that to our students. So I'll let you read that information, but that is information about um, summer camp. Again, I want to say congratulations to Mary Lou Olson. New grandbaby was born last Saturday. Uh, Finnegan Milness. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying the middle name right, but uh, we're thankful for healthy baby. Mom is doing well from what I've heard, but continue to pray for that new family. And then also, um, this week is Chuck Wakeley's 95th birthday, and of course we can't throw him a party right now. Um, he is at the Good Sam in Bloomfield, but we would like to do a card shower. So if you'd be willing to put a card in the mail tomorrow, it would probably get there on the, the third or the fourth. Um, so we want to uh, celebrate with Chuck in that way, and we hope that you will um, do that if you are able. Um, and then finally on the back, you'll see um, we have recently had some extra books donated to the library. If you're somebody who likes organizing filing, doing something like that, and you'd be willing to give a few hours one day to categorize the new books and get them in their right place, do some work on the library, um, that would be a huge blessing. Um, contact Betty. Um, is that okay, Betty? Um, okay, I, I don't know a lot about it. Um, I know my ABCs, kind of, but <laughs> to be on that. So, um, but if you would be willing to, to do that, that would be a huge blessing. And then finally, um, it's not too late to give to the outdoor classroom in memory of Tish Hennings. That's going to be an awesome thing um, in our community for many, many years to come. So if you haven't had an opportunity to do that yet, I would encourage you um, to do that. Hey, we're going to worship right now. We're going to praise and worship. So worship team, um, please come, and uh, if you would please stand, uh, let's, let's worship together this morning. You know, Ray, this last week I've been real convicted of having the Samuel syndrome. And if you remember when Samuel was sent to choose a new king for Israel, he went out to Bethlehem to the house and family of Jesse to see which of Jesse's sons God wanted to be king. And first the eldest came and whoa, that was a good looking guy and he's strong and big and, and most, uh, Samuel says, I, probably this one. And God says, no. And he went through all of them and God kept saying, no. God says, you're looking on the outside. You gotta look at the heart. And I've been looking at what's going on in our country. And I said, what these people are doing is wrong. But I'm just looking at their actions. I'm not looking at their heart. Something in their heart has caused them to act this way. And I don't know what that is. I really shouldn't condemn them. I should pray for them. You see, what's going on here isn't just something that happened and so God's going to have to fix it. No. What's going on today was designed by God for us. We used to sing a song, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know God could fix it. Yeah, we've got a great God and he has created this day. I'm leaving my past behind I'm setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus I'm reaching my hands to yours Believing there's so much more Knowing that all you have in store for me is good It's good, today is 
as a day you have made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow, trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today, I'm putting my fears aside, I'm leaving my doubts behind, I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more. Knowing that all you have in store for me is good, it's good. Today is the day you have made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow, I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. I will stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. And all my days I will live for you. And all my days I'll live for you. And I will stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. And all my days I'll live for you. and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm giving you all my fears and sorrows. Where you lead me, I will follow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the Oh, 
glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heavens, our King will return for his own. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout, all glory to Jesus alone. Jesus, we lift our eyes. Our Savior ever true, oh Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Jesus, we lift our our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true, oh Jesus. We turn our eyes to you, oh Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Jesus in the streets. 
streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name not to fear. Help us to trust and rejoice in that name. Amen. Won't you please be seated. song. Good morning. Man, you look good. Missed you all. Scripture. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Hang on. This is the word. anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus <clears throat> that song is what did it to me <laughs> gee money Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Yes, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. <clears throat> Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by <clears throat> worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, 
do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Awesome. So this morning, uh, we are in our last week in this series that I titled Anchored to the Promises of God, where we have been looking at some of the truths of Scripture that can help us get through different storms that we go through in life. Uh, So far, we've talked about the storms of life that just make us feel like quitting. We've talked about the storms that cause our souls to be weary, the storms that find ourselves in trouble and when we are weak. And today, we're going to talk about being anchored to the promises of God when we are anxious. You know, I recently heard a story about a guy who was driving in the downtown streets of a very busy city for the first time, and he was anxious. Okay, maybe you've had that experience. For me, the worst one was one time driving in downtown Atlanta. Oh, that was horrible. He was anxious about being in downtown of this busy city, but he felt, you know, due to, with 21st century technology, he had a smartphone, so he felt that he would be okay and could find his way to his destination. So he put his destination into his phone um, and, and started driving. He quickly felt that something might be off as his phone instructed him to turn down this like side alley. It wasn't even really a street. Maybe your phone's done that to you before. He was, you know, kind of confused, but he thought, okay, if I just keep driving straight, it will correct itself um, and, and I'll be fine. But he was starting to get a little anxious. So he kept driving straight, and in, in, in a little ways, the phone again told him to take a left. And this time it was on to, it, it kind of looked like a street, a narrow street. So he went ahead and turned left onto this narrow street. Well, to his horror, he soon saw 30 bicyclists riding straight for him. He had accidentally turned onto a bike path. Of course, as the first bicyclist approached him, he let him know that he was on a bike path. Said, move it, bud, you're on a bike path. Every bicyclist that came by had very helpful comments letting him know that he had turned onto a bike path. And his anxiety was growing. After this group of bicyclists finally passed, he got turned around got back onto the street, pulled into a parking garage to figure out, just to calm himself and figure out what in the world was possibly wrong. He started looking at his phone, and what he finally figured out was while one of his children had his phone, they had gotten into the Google Maps app and turned the app to bike mode. (laughs) So he had been trying to get to his destination, but his phone was telling him how to ride his bike to the destination. Ultimately, he was listening to the wrong voice. You know, I think this is a great example of why a lot of people have so much anxiety in life. It is because they have been listening to the wrong voice. There's a voice inside of a lot of us that is constantly playing out worst-case scenarios for whatever situation we are going through in life. The voice says things to us like, there's no way you're going to get that project done. That person is going to be so angry at you about this. That's not good enough. You're not good enough. You're going to fail if you try to do that. God's not going to forgive you for that. What will those people think about you when they find out? If you hear statements like this in your head, you are listening to the wrong voice. So let me ask this question. What are the top two or three things 
that you're anxious about right now. Just consider that for a second. Maybe I could even say it this way. In what areas of your life do you experience the most anxiety or the most common anxiety? You know, I recently heard a poll done by the American Psychiatric Society, and I should mention this poll was done before this whole COVID situation. And this poll said that 39% of Americans are more anxious this year than they were last year. Over one-third. Also, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States, affecting nearly 40 million adults in the U.S., about one in every five Americans. And again, that result was given before COVID-19 started. I also read that millennials, my generation, are the most likely to experience high levels of anxiety. I wonder why. Um, Women are more likely than men. But across the board, we are becoming a nation of nervous wrecks. Okay, next I looked at what things people were most likely to be anxious about. And this is what I found. People are anxious first and foremost about health. Second, about safety. And third, about finances. Some common things I would add just from observation or personal experience would be relationships, job or job security, and school. So despite all of our advances that have been made in this world, like smartphones and and car safety features and healthier food and more medicines and so much more, Despite all of these things, our society as a whole is experiencing more anxiety than possibly ever before, at least in the history of our nation. And I can confidently say that the last three months has has amplified or magnified this issue even more for a lot of people. Now, I know that anxiety disorders are a real thing, and there are great doctors and Christian psychologists who are doing work in this area and can offer amazing help. But for a lot of us, much of the anxiety that we experience in life simply comes from listening to the wrong voices. And I think that sadly, a lot of people have believed the lie that says, well, that's just how I am. I'm just an anxious person. That's just how I am. Or, well, that's just how the world is today. You know, we live in a fast-paced world. Anxiety is just part of life. And along with believing these lies, they believe that anxiety is something they're just going to have to endure for the rest of life. Well, I have some good news for us. This is not the truth when it comes to anxiety. To find the truth, we want to look in the Word of God. So first, I want us to look at one of the verses that Brother Steve just read that I have actually used a lot when dealing with anxiety and worry in my own life. And I want to make that point clear. This isn't just a nice verse or couple verses that that you put on a piece of artwork or write on a coffee cup or or I found in a Google search. No, this, this passage, like many others that we've talked about in this series, is one that I have used, I have clung to, I have memorized, and I look too often when I'm anxious. So first, I want us to look at that passage in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Okay, the first thing I want us to notice is the all-encompassing nature of that verse. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. So it doesn't matter if it's your health, your job, your kids, your finances, coronavirus, the economy, or whatever else. There is never a situation that we are in that is outside of God's presence and control. So therefore, there is never a situation where we need to be anxious. Now, I don't believe that Paul is saying here that we should never have an anxious thought or an anxious moment in life. Those are going to come. Okay, rather what he is saying is that when those moments come, we should not harbor them. We should not hold on to them. We should not let them build up in our life. 
Rather, as soon as we become anxious, we should go to God by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, we should let God know about the issue. But I want to ask this question also. Why did, why did Paul put that little insertion, those two words, with thanksgiving, in verse 6? Okay, the verse would make just as much sense without those two words. If you just said, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and position, petition, present your request to God. Okay, the verse still makes sense. But there are those two words, with thanksgiving. And I don't want us to miss this important point that Paul is making. Okay, Paul is saying that the quickest way for us to get rid of anxiety in our lives is, first of all, to talk to God about it right? Prayer, to let him know what we are anxious about, and then to ask him to remove that anxiety. That would be petition, but then also to show gratitude, to start expressing to God all the things that you have to be thankful for, just listing off in worship all the ways that God has come through for you in the past. You'll be surprised how quickly your anxiety just starts to disappear if you will do that if you're anxious about your kids but you start expressing to god your thankfulness for how he has protected them how he has provided for them in the past if you're anxious about your finances but you start to express gratitude to god for how he's provided for your needs in the past your anxiety will start to go away whatever else you may be anxious about if you'll lift it up in prayer and petition and then with gratitude start to express all the things you have to be thankful for god will remove that anxiety and how do i know that first of all because he's done that very thing for me hundreds of times in my own life but then look at verse 7 verse 7 paul writes and the peace of god which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, if you underline or highlight in your Bible, underline that word will in verse 7. That is a guarantee from God. That is a promise from God. It doesn't say God's peace might guard your heart and mind. No, it says that it will. Even when it doesn't make any sense to have peace, Paul says that peace transcends all understanding. Okay, there are things that you and I go through in life that we all go through in life and most people would say about those things Yes, I understand why you are anxious about that Okay, or some would even say yes, you should be anxious about that But god wants to give us a peace that transcends understanding even in those situations Or a peace from god that the world won't understand because they would say, how do you have peace in this situation? It doesn't make any sense. But how do we receive it? By casting our cares on Jesus through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. All right, I've asked Shelly um, to come now, and she's going to sing this amazing song that makes this, this, this point so very powerfully. So while Shelley is singing, I just want us all to soak in the words of this song. Really make this song our prayer today. If you want to close your eyes, that's great. If you want to watch the screen and really soak in the words, that's great. But I want this song to be our prayer. the night when worry finds me in the middle of a fight when strength is gone in the middle of a fire when fear is closing and you are you are my song you're my hope when hope is gone I will cast my Cast on you the Almighty. I will cast my cares on you, cause you're good. I will cast my cares on you, cause you love me. You love me. Oh, oh, because you love me. Bye. 
light when strength is gone in the middle of a fire when fear is closing in you are you are my song you're my hope when hope is gone i will cast my cares on you the almighty i will cast my cares on you cause you're good i will cast my cares on you cause you love me you love me oh oh because you love me oh oh because you love me god of glory you are able through your power to be faithful god of mercy every moment you are near to me god of glory you are able through your power to be Shelly, yeah, wow, um, that's what it's all about, <laughs> casting our cares on Christ, how, how foolish of us that so often we hold on to our anxiety, our worries, our cares, when the, when the God of the universe, the almighty creator of all, wants us to cast them upon him, wants us to find relief in him. So with this in mind, um, with the time we have left, I want to suggest two practical ways for us to do just that and therefore to overcome our anxiety in life. The first thing that I want us to do is you have to identify the lie that you have been believing. Okay, I once heard a message um, by, by Pastor Craig Groeschel. Uh, he's the pastor of Life Church, a large church in Oklahoma City. Actually, they have campuses all over the United States, but a pastor I like to listen to. Um, and in this message, he told this story about once him and his staff team were at the church. They were playing a game of capture the flag in the church between the, the church staff. I don't know how that goes in a church. I don't know why they were playing, but they were playing capture the flag. And the one rule to their game was you couldn't capture the other team's flag before 8 a.m., so you couldn't come into the building like in the middle of the night and, and capture the flag. You couldn't do it before 8 a.m. Well, somebody who was on the other team than Pastor Craig um, decided or found out, first of all, that their flag was in Pastor Craig's office. So he decided that he was going to get up real early one morning and go into Pastor Craig's office and hide in the closet and then when 8 a.m. came, he would jump out of the closet, snatch the flag, and win the game. 
The only issue was that morning, Pastor Craig got in at about 7 o'clock, and he heard something in his closet. So he walks over to the closet, opens the closet, sees the guy in there, slams it shut, is holding his foot on it. He grabs a chair that's by to try to prop it under the door to lock the guy in the closet. The only problem was the chair wasn't the right size. It really wasn't working. But Pastor Craig, you know, still kind of did it, and, and he said to the guy, ha, you're locked in there now. Okay, so this guy starts pounding on the door, let me out, let me out. The only issue was the chair wasn't actually holding him in the closet. He never actually tried to turn the handle and push the door open. Okay, some of you today might be locked in a closet of anxiety, but the only thing keeping you in that closet is a lie. Okay, you have to identify the lie. Because once you've identified the lie, the truth will set you free, as Jesus said in John 8. Maybe you have anxiety about your future, and you've believed the lie that you and you alone control everything in your future. Maybe you have anxiety about your kids, and you've believed the lie that if you're diligent enough and do all the right things as a parent, you can keep your kids from all harm in life. Maybe you have anxiety about what someone else thinks about you, and you've believed the lie that what other think, people think about you determines your worth instead of what God thinks about you. You know, in, in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, Paul writes, We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Did you know that there is a battle in each and every one of our minds? This battle is between God's truth about you and Satan's lies to you. God's truth about you and Satan's lies to you. Some of us have anxious thoughts that are just going crazy in our minds. And in some ways debilitating or controlling our thoughts. And why are they are able to do this and able to do so much damage is because we have never taken them captive with the truth of God's word. And church, get this. Some of us have thoughts in our brain that are just running wild. And I'm going to call it our what if -er. Okay, or what if -er. That's not actually a word. Sounds like something I might try to play in Scrabble. But um, our what if -er. Okay, you might have a what if -er in your brain that is always thinking, what if this goes wrong? What if this happens to my kids? What if the economy doesn't bounce back? What if coronavirus doesn't go away? What if, what if, what if? And this what if -er causes you to have a lot of anxiety. Because it's not just an occasional thought you have. It's actually your regular way of thinking. What if? What if? What if? I think what we need to do is work to replace our what if -er with a but god -er. Okay? Something's going wrong in your life, but God is still in control. I can't completely control my kids, but God loves them even more than me. The economy is crashing. But God has always supplied all of my needs. Coronavirus caught us by surprise, but God was not surprised. Okay, I believe very practically speaking, that is how we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Have you ever thought about what you think about? Okay, I know that's, that's a weird question or sounds weird, but really, have you ever thought about what you think about. What are the two or three main thoughts that you carry with you every single day? Do they have to do with what other people think about you? Do they have to do with your to-do list? Do they have to do with things you cannot control? And do those thoughts lead you to peace and freedom, or do they lead to anxiety and bondage? Do those thoughts bring you closer to Christ and to truth, or do they push you further away? With this in mind, the first practical step 
towards overcoming anxiety in your life is to identify the lies you are believing and replace them with God's truth. The second practical step is to trust God to give you what you need when you need it. Here's another question. What is actually at the root of our anxiety? Okay, I know we've talked a lot or I've mentioned a lot of the things that cause anxiety, like jobs and kids and finances and relationships and health. But what is behind those things? What is actually at the root of our anxiety? I believe what is usually at the root of our anxiety, if we're being brutally honest, is that we don't actually believe God's going to come through for us or that God's timing is actually what's best. I don't know if God actually wants what's best for me, so I need to make sure to take control and to spend a lot of time worrying so that I can get what I need when I need it on my own. Okay, now even just saying that, we know that sounds ridiculous, but that is how we act and think and what drives our decisions so often. That thought process is what causes us to have anxiety a lot of times. And that is where our other anchor passage from Scripture today comes into play. I want to read it again just to help us really understand it. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Okay, in this passage, Jesus specifically focuses on food and water and clothing because those are some of our most basic necessities. But the principle that he is teaching applies to every area of our lives, including our relationships, our health, our finances, our parenting, our jobs, everything. In verse 33, Jesus says that if we'll seek God's kingdom— and his righteousness first, he'll take care of these other things. Then verse 34 says not to worry about the future, because each day has enough trouble of its own. Okay, God has not given me what I need for the rest of my life right now. He hasn't done that. If he did that, I would not grow in faith anymore. And I wouldn't actually have any need for God. It would kind of be like, all right, thanks, God. I guess I'll see you in heaven, okay, right? If he gave us everything we need. No, instead, if we seek him, he'll give me what I need right now. And he'll give me the promise that he'll continue to provide day by day. You know, you might be here this morning and you are already anxious about something that's going to happen next week or next month, or maybe even next year, or in several years. Or you may even be anxious about something that you don't even know if it's going to happen. Okay, I've been guilty of that one many times. I'll get all worked up and anxious about something, and how it will go, and what the results will be, and then it doesn't even happen, right? Okay, I spent all my time being anxious for nothing. So here is what we each have to decide today and every day. Am I going to choose faith over fear? Am I going to choose prayer 
over worry? Am I spending more time in prayer or more time worrying? Am I going to choose gratitude over entitlement? Am I going to choose surrender over control? Am I going to choose to believe that the God of the Bible who has been there for me and knows what is best for me and provided for all my needs time and time again will come through in his perfect timing? Am I going to turn off my what if -er, what if, what if, what if, and turn on my but god -er? Okay, that is ultimately what will allow us to find peace in life and eliminate anxiety. And it is a daily choice we must make. All of these things are a daily choice we must make and all about a daily surrender to God. Because if we don't do this on a daily basis, our natural tendency will always be to fall back into control and worry which will lead us back into anxiety. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for your goodness to us, God. God, I thank you for giving us your word full of so many promises that we can cling to, that we can hold on to, that we can know as absolute truth when we are going through the storms of this life. God, I thank you that you are a personal God, you are a relational God who is involved in our lives every single day. You don't leave us to figure this out on our own. God, thank you for your promise that if we will cast our anxieties on you, if we will come to you in prayer and petition with thanksgiving and present our requests to you, let you know what we're going through, you will give us your peace. Wow, God, that is a peace that we need so badly. That is a peace that our world needs so, so badly. A peace that we look for in so many other things. We look for it in financial stability, in, in relational happiness. We look for it in so many areas, but that peace can only be found in you, God. So I pray that you would help us to seek your kingdom first, God, to seek your righteousness first, and give up control and let you have control of all the other things, God. The things that we cling to so tightly, we feel are so important, but really, they aren't. God, thank you for this promise from your word and for the opportunity to share in it, to be reminded of it from your word this morning. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Won't you please stand for our closing hymn? Christ the sure and steady anchor In the fury of the storm When the winds of Oh, 
hopeless somehow. Oh, my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance. See his love forever proved. All my hope is in the anchor. It shall never be removed. Christ is sure and steady anchor as we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory as we draw our final breath, we will cross that great horizon, clouds behind and life secure, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we've endured. Christ the sure of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true, we will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be That is our promise. We want to hold fast to the anchor of Christ. Um, hey, I do want to let you know next Sunday we'll be starting a new series, uh, Summer in the Psalms. And each week we will be looking at a different psalm um, as the Lord leads. So I'm excited for that. I think it'll be um, a good summer. I also want to remind you, Wednesday night, 630 Awana Awards, we would love, even if you weren't involved with Awana, but you want to come help us honor and celebrate these kids and the hard work um, they have done, it, it'll be a great time. And please pray for good weather um, for that. Hey, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Um, let's cast our cares on Jesus. Let's be known for the peace that we have from God and let others know about that peace they can have. In a time of so much anxiety, so much worry, that's how we can shine the light. Thanks for being here this morning. You're dismissed.